So this is what I'm going to discuss, just an overview of uh, long COVID. And uh, so then it's cardiac complications and then management briefly and conclusion, uh, keeping with time. And this is where, uh, the, where we are now and uh, the COVID. And then we are all in red zone. It's a huge uh, the health burden and uh, the impact on the economy and the livelihood of people is unprecedented. And so when it, I mean, I'm not going to explain everything uh, in details about the COVID pathophysiology and all, but uh, this is just roughly acute COVID. We know that uh, symptoms last for about four weeks after starting the illness, then it carry on ongoing symptoms of COVID. And uh, so then up to about uh, four to uh, 12 weeks after acute illness, then go into long COVID and the various definitions, but anyway, so it changes. And, but like at the moment, long COVID usually defined as symptoms developed during or after COVID-19 continue beyond 12 weeks after illness start. And uh, so, uh, so you have to make sure that there is no other uh, diagnosis coming to uh, overlap here. And uh, so, as I told you, signs and symptoms that uh, develop during or after an infection consistent with COVID-19, which continue more than 12 weeks, uh, actually is long COVID. And uh, so you have to make sure that there's no other diagnosis, like in case of, as previous speaker mentions, respiratory, so asthmatic, chronic, obstructive lung disease and in cardiac, existing cardiac uh, diseases, so you have to exclude. And it has to be coming from uh, original COVID infection. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very complex disease, I believe. It's uh, some define it as a multi, as, as, uh, as far as cardiovascular disease is concerned, it's a multi-system thrombombolic disease. And uh, so some even believe that the cause yet unknown, this long COVID thing, some believe this is chronic inflammation, maybe it's like uh, autoimmune, but we all know that it's a kind of a complex interplay among uh, coagulopathy, endotheliopathy, and the inflammation. It's, it's a very complex phenomenon. And uh, so we will try to explain a little bit of that. And the prevalence varies, various reports from various countries, various studies, various observational data shows it's about five to 30% of COVID patients go into um, the long COVID. The increased risk for long COVID usually happens with pre-existing cardiovascular disease and people who are having already cardiovascular disease. And uh, so diabetic, obese, the, people, the obese people, and uh, so hypertensive people, they are, they are they, they, they run a high risk for this particular long COVID condition. And also remember that people who have high risk, though these categories of people, they run a, the outcome is also not as uh, good as uh, the patient did not, who did not have uh, these uh, the risk factors. And so when it comes to manifestations, so I'm supposed to talk about cardiovascular manifestations and the impact and so we all know, even the previous speaker highlighted that the muscular skeletal system is affected, nervous system is affected, respiratory system is affected, the skin, even autoimmune. And so that's why some define this as an autoimmune condition. And uh, so what I'm going to concentrate very much on cardiovascular uh, manifestations. So this is just a tough idea uh, about the manifestation and there are the cardiovascular uh, the manifestation I'm going to talk about, you can see that there's a variety of, uh, the, I mean, diverse uh, symptoms, the, the, all the system of the body is affected. But remember that respiratory and cardiovascular uh, systems are mostly uh, affected. Out of cardiovascular, uh, the, uh, the system, that the manifestation wise, I mean, I'm going to talk about the myocarditis picture, heart failure and uh, ischemic heart disease. Uh, picture and uh, so um, so persistent symptoms can be like even in uh, the during post covid period or long covid period they can have palpitation these are the commonest symptoms as previous speaker highlighted the dyspnea and chest pain they may not be having cardiovascular issue but still they might complain of these symptoms and then come to a cardiologist and so the long sequel the real ones are like myocarditis 
myocardial ischemia, the deep in thrombosis and pulmonary embolism, and some arrhythmias. The POTS, I will speak to you about what POTS is like uh, later on. And then the broken heart syndrome. Then that's another thing people talk about this broken heart syndrome. I'll tell you what it is. And so this is the interaction between um, cardiovascular disease and COVID-19. It's a very complex thing. No one knows exactly what it is. But now people have understood it's a, it's a kind of a uh, the interplay, very complex interplay between uh, the coagulation system, endothelium, endothelium as well as uh, the inflammation of all the, uh, the organs. And so affecting mainly the, the respiratory system and cardiovascular system. And uh, so thereby you get all these complications, ischemic heart disease and uh, the arrhythmias, myocarditis and thromboembolic uh, phenomena. So when it comes to myocarditis, and so this is how it happens. And so virus infect the lung and they are like immune response and then you get the cytokine storms, inflammatory cells, autoantibodies, and so these all affected various organs. So this particular study published in the uh, European uh, Heart Journal, you can see the various type of uh, inflammatory response. Even with the virus in the myocardium, you can see the like lymphocytic, uh, the predominance myocarditis without the virus, with the virus. I mean, this study, they have analyzed very carefully the how it affects and what, what are the type of uh, this inflammatory response in the, uh, the, in the, in the myocardium. And so cytokines play a part and autoantibodies play a part and so all that. It's a very complex uh, thing in, even in myocardium. But one thing is certain. So cells are uh, inflamed, inflamed and endothelium cell, there is inflamed and there can be cell necrosis as well as you can see the microembolizations in the, uh, the capillaries. And so again, the myocardial injury and the biomarkers, you can see, I mean, this, this particular study again shows how the biomarkers uh, could be elevated uh, in um, uh, the, this, when there, is a, when there is a myocarditis, when there's a picture of myocarditis in patients with long COVID. And this, remember that is about 30% of patients in this particular study. Uh, so they had the, 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 the myocarditis picture and there are, they checked the troponin uh, B and P as well as uh, CPKNB. I mean, these are all cardio-specific uh, biomarkers. You, could, you can see in these charts is statistically significant. This uh, in patients with um, uh, the statistically significant numbers had uh, the the these elevated bio, the biomarkers. And uh, so also when you have this cardiac picture, I mean, you don't see sometimes this this uh, elaborate very well this picture. You can see. The percentage of people who had various components, whether they had the myocarditis and they sometimes they had the pericarditis, they had the uh, ischemic components, they had the pericardial effusion, all together. One may not see one in isolation. So just myocarditis. Sometimes there are patients, myocarditis, ischemic picture, as well as the pericarditis. It's, 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 a, it's a very complex again. And you can see that's normal heart. Uh, so beating normal heart, you can see the LV very contracting very well. And uh, so the, this is a patient with uh, uh, the myocardial. I'm sorry. And then, and so this is a patient with um, the myocarditis. You can you can see that LV contractions are usually is like. Uh, the, the, the globally affected. You don't see the proper, uh, the, the contractions, normal contractions. It is, uh, it is uh, globally uh, the hypokinetic. And so sometimes they go into severe heart failure. And so they can de develop congestive heart failure in patients with uh, myocarditis. And uh, so therefore the diagnosis is very, very important, very early uh, stages. And so for the diagnosis, I think most important thing is uh, the, the biomarkers. Biomarker, the, uh, the troponins are elevated. It can be above even uh, the thousands. And the CPKMB is elevated. And uh, so the, then uh, the, the ECG might show certain changes. Uh, usually you see STT changes. And uh, so uh, those, those are the things uh, uh, you should uh, look for. And uh, so, 
And so this is uh, this is something uh, the, the I uh, have to tell you that in investigation wise you have to do a I mean other than the echocardiography and uh, so you can do uh, even the MRI uh, scan cardiac MRI there you can see the the changes the hypokinetic areas very well as uh, intracellular edema as well as in long COVID you can see these fibrotic areas. Uh, the the in the myocardium as in, as in the lung you can see the uh, ultimately end up in uh, the fibrotic uh, myocardium and so then going into uh, the congestive uh, heart failure and so what about myocardial ischemia DVT and pulmonary embolism this is also another manifestation of uh, uh, lone COVID and during even acute stage you can have that but uh, with uh, now they have found that even in lone COVID after three months they can have uh, uh, ischemic heart disease manifestation. So, uh, the, so how do they get this? So there can be people with concomitant increase of uh, the already uh, developed plaque. They have established plaque, but with the concomitant increase in cytokines and inflammatory mediators, mediators could cause inflammation. And uh, so inflammation of the plaque itself and it's softened and then you can have plaque rupture. So you can have ischemic picture, either non-STEMI, STEMI uh, or unstable angina. And uh, so sometimes this can be due to uh, the, this, uh, the, the biomarkers, uh, the, not biomarker, the cytokine storm. And so even the direct invasion of the virus could cause uh, immune reaction in the plaque and co uh, cause uh, plaque rupture. And also remember that virus can uh, the, the attack or infect the endothelial cells and the, the media and in adventitia. So therefore you can have a, the, the, the endothelial, uh, the constriction, the uh, capillary constriction, and uh, so the, the result in uh, myocardial ischemia. And so this is a direct and uh, indirect uh, the causes. I mean, the virus can go and attack directly to endothelium and the plaque, or may not have a plaque already established, normal uh, coronary arteries, but still uh, the patient can have endothelial, uh, endothelial, endothelialitis, and coagulopathy, as well as um, the microembolizations of the, um, uh, the coronary arteries, as well as the capillaries causing infarct, uh, as well as uh, unstable angina, or even uh, diffuse ischemia picture. And uh, so there is a risk of, uh, of a thrombotic event after COVID. And uh, so, I mean, acute coronary syndrome, when it take in a long COVID after acute phase, you can, I mean, it's various reports give various uh, uh, the figures, uh, 7 to 28 percent. And uh, so DVT is not that uncommon. Though. So DVT and pulmonary embolism is about 5 to 30 percent in various series. And uh, so as I told you, the mechanism is either direct, uh, direct endothelial damage due to COVID virus itself, or maybe cytokine storms, immunological reaction related to injury. And maybe the systemic uh, inflammation itself, complement activation and coagulation system activated. By the way, remember this, but now they have recently found that even this virus uh, go and um, uh, binds to the platelet itself. And the, when the platelets get, uh, the, then platelets get activated and then can could cause uh, uh, thrombotic event. So it's, it's, it's yet to find out all these things. So we are still learning about this virus as well as their uh, sequelae and the complication with regard to cardiovascular uh, disease. So even this uh, shows, you can see that uh, micro myocardial infarction, it can be micro, as I told you before, it can be a macro infarct, it can be micro infarct. This, this study, again, they have studied the, the, the pattern of the, uh, the cell necrosis, as well as you can see the, uh, the, the post-mortem study, you can just a big infarct and proceptor. And uh, so also you can see this, um, uh, micro thrombi and the capillary, there are a lot of uh, uh, thrombi in the capillary, and then you can see the inflammation going on. So these are all you can find in uh, patients in uh, acute stage, uh, subacute space, as well as uh, in chronic phase, that is long COVID situations. And uh, so this is another case I have highlighted. This young guy is about a few weeks ago, um, uh, came uh, uh, half vaccinated, and uh, so no significant comorbidities, no coronary factors. He came here and he, was, he got COVID and he was in quarantine. 
and uh, so he got chest pain, very ischemic type, very classical, and he came late to the hospital and emergency care at National Hospital uh, Colombo. So we diagnosed extensive anterior MI, and uh, so this is what happened. Uh, the Uh, so this is what happened uh, so uh, the in the angiogram and uh, so you can see uh, the, this view you can see the the uh, the circumflex is intact but you can you can't see uh, uh, LAD is totally gone and uh, so you see now people uh, did the he was in cardiac shock anyway somebody not therapy not given because it's too late and uh, so this is the i could just uh, introduce the wire why itself opened the artery and uh, so then, uh, so you can see now LAD is nice flow. And uh, so, um, and so normal, uh, the, 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 uh, the reperfuse very well. And uh, so he, he was safe. And then, uh, so this is a typical, there's no, there was no plaque there. And this is a typical post COVID, uh, or acute, subacute phase uh, COVID uh, infarct. And so you can see the ECG also like, um, uh, when he came, as uh, significant ST elevation and in anterior chest lead after uh, the, doing the angioplasty, you could see that uh, actually it has come down very significantly. So, well reperfused. And uh, so, this is all about uh, cardiac uh, ischemia. And uh, so, what about cardiac arrhythmias? And cardiac arrhythmias usually could be due to various reasons. So, it could be due to ischemic injuries, can be due to myocardial injury cell injury involved in the conducting system. And uh, so there can be a catecholamine surge and uh, during COVID, maybe due to um, the, their anxiety about the disease, maybe due to the disease itself, because this virus can go and attack uh, autonomic nervous system. So they, you can have uh, bready and tacky episodes. And uh, so this is the, the, the basic mechanism. So, but most of the time we, we could see in these patients, inappropriate sinus tachycardia. They, most of them after COVID, maybe after a few months, they, they come with uh, the tachycardia, very inappropriate. And at first they get tachycardia. This is the commonest cardiac rhythm problem in uh, post uh, COVID patients. So this is the case, you can see the heart rate is like 100, 110. And uh, so this is uh, post COVID patients and they usually complain uh, palpitation at first. And so this is a POT syndrome. So now the, uh, by the way, even in uh, the arrhythmia, you can have various arrhythmia. The commonest is tachycardia. You can have SVT. They can have atrial fibrillation. They can have cardiac arrest or went to the, the ET, VF. All that is so bizarre because you know the underlying mechanism. So there can be ischemia, myocardial necrosis, cardiac damage, myocardial. All these are triggers for uh, rhythm problem. It's, it's so bizarre. And so these are the commonest uh, ones I'm going to highlight. So this is another thing that I recently uh, described. It's called postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, POT syndrome. This is an abnormal increase on heart rate with standing and without, without usually fall of blood pressure. And may be seen in other viral infections like influenza and glandular fever, but people have found that it's um, more common with uh, the, the post-COVID uh, situations. And uh, usually they complain lightheadedness with rapid heart rate, and they might even collapse occasionally with faintishness. And so they can't, usually these people can't ex do uh, exercise, especially treadmill, they can't even walk. So this is after a few months of COVID, by the way. And so usually treatment wise, you have to advise them, support them with uh, stocking. Uh, we have to advise them to take more fluid. And uh, so then uh, the, the exercises, they, they should not go on treadmill and running. So they should have like rowing machine. So like standing kind of exercise as a sitting kind of exercises and for a while. And so this is called broken heart syndrome. It's called, we must have heard this uh, uh, Takashubo cardioma, but this is described in Japan. You can see these people. And this is due to a, the, the usually the weakening of the heart muscle due to severe stress and emotional trauma due to COVID. This can be due to COVID per se. This can may not be involved with the COVID. And so I'm talking about the post-COVID. And so you can get in post-COVID patients. So they have a lot of anxiety about their job, about their life, about their family, everything. So they go to a lot of emotional trauma and stress. So therefore they can, they can have this. I have seen a couple of patients, of course, 
So you see the left ventricle in normal heart, you can see typical, uh, the Takashogurta, the Japanese uh, octopus pot. And you can see the classical, uh, the, the pattern or the shape of the enlarged left ventricle in this particular condition. And we, we have seen quite a few, uh, last few weeks actually, this uh, Takashubo, the broken heart syndrome. And so management wise, I don't think I would take uh, the lot, uh, lot of time here. General measures, we all know now that, uh, general measures. And then specific measures, of course, with regard to uh, the, the, the particular conditions. So all depending on the particular condition, whether the patient has uh, got uh, myocarditis, whether the patient has got uh, uh, the ischemic heart disease, or uh, my, all depends. But one thing is certain. So you have to vaccinate these people. So vaccination prevent this long COVID, especially cardiovascular complication, because studies have very clearly shown and including the uh, lockdown. And uh, so in the management, I think we have to uh, uh, test these people. We have to assess these people. You have to try out these people. So patient chest pain during exercise, and uh, also these people, they complain. And so they could be possibly cardiac. So then you have to analyze them, screen them, counsel them. And so even difficulty in breathing and exercise, these are the common symptoms. And these, uh, the two groups of people should be carefully analyzed. You should not miss uh, a cardiac involvement. The fatigue, muscle ache generally could be non-cardiac causes. And uh, so, and though also the, some people complain of their increased heart rate, pounding of the heart, irregular heartbeat. Usually they are not having severe heart rhythm problem. And so therefore you don't need to worry. And then you do some basic investigations and counsel them. And uh, so echocardiogram is very, very important on these patients. So ECG and echocardiogram. And so you have to have follow-up uh, even uh, patients with full recovery. You have to have uh, follow-up uh, uh, echocardiograms and you can see actually, and people who have, who have been followed up and you, you, they have found that uh, LV dysfunction slowly starting in during post-COVID period and even zero to uh, the, up to about 18% in certain series. And diastolic impairment, this is a very important thing. Even young people after COVID, they can have a diastolic dysfunction. And uh, so this is an important thing that could be due to uh, post-COVID uh, situations. And the even they can develop pericardial effusion and our right ventricular dysfunction. Now here, right, right ventricular dysfunction can be due to several reasons. One is uh, the pulmonary uh, issue that as the previous speaker highlighted, they can go into fibrosis, go pulmonale, and then right ventricular uh, dysfunction. And also that's uh, chronic pulmonary hypertension. I mean, these are the reasons. Also. Remember that these people are more vulnerable for DVT. So they can have a chronic thromboembolic uh, uh, condition causing severe pulmonary hypertension. So these are the, uh, the, 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 the these, these things, when you do echocardiogram follow-up, you have to assess these things. And also cardiopulmonary exercise test. Previous speaker again highlighted that oxygen desaturation after months of COVID uh, infection, you can have. And it's, it's a very common, I mean, the, the oxygen desaturation you can have even even 30 to 30, 30, 35% of pay, patients, even during the, the exercise ECG testing, poor exercise tolerance, poor oxygen uh, the desaturation. So these, these are also, you can um, um, uh, uh, study, you can uh, counsel them and then follow them up with regard to respiratory functions, maybe chest x-ray or with regard to um, uh, the cardiac uh, uh, the the problems like uh, the then you, they, you should do regular uh, echocardiography uh, test and so the vaccination so uh, there are there are uh, reports actually coming uh, now vaccination has been shown to reduce the incidence of long COVID and so people who are vaccinated the the chances of they going to uh, long COVID they have found that it's low so vaccination is very important again here and uh, so if you are fully vaccinated. I think your chance of going to long COVID is uh, lesser than in people who didn't have uh, vaccination. And so and it's lockdown, we know in addition to all these things, we always uh, talk about lockdown. The lockdown, as recently we, we are promoting lockdown. We had, recently had, we had a major uh, seminar with all these speakers and then how to go for a smart lockdown. That is a way forward. And so if you, that is prevent the infection and then prevent the COVID, the long COVID. And so it's very important, the, low, the, the smart lockdown. That is where we don't do harsh or hard lockdown. The, the stage-wise 
lockdown depending on the severity of the infection or are the incidence of the, the COVID uh, uh, infection in the community or in the country. So you can have different, different stages like red, uh, maybe amber, maybe yellow, maybe green. So we are now at the moment in red, we are dreaming for green nature. So this is what we should do in prevention. As in conclusion, so the, we all know that low, the long COVID is becoming a major global health concern. We haven't seen, this may be the tip of the iceberg. So we are very much focusing on, at the moment, uh, the acute uh, situation. But, the, but I have to tell you this, this is going to be a major problem. And the POTS is something new, it's a common manifestation when you come to cardiovascular manifestation among patients with long COVID. And uh, so, but still the reasons is poorly understood. And uh, the post-acute cardiovascular sequelae, the myocarditis, right ventricular dysfunction, myocardial ischemia, maybe pericardial involvement. And uh, so it can be seen, it can be seen up to three months, four months, even six months. And so follow-up is very, very important as I highlighted. And so there is you know, this dissociation between the symptoms and the objective measures of cardiopulmonary health in patients. And it's a very significant problem because there can be people, they don't have anything. And so no symptoms, but when you do the objective testing, echo, maybe lung function test, as previous speaker highlighted, so you can, you can find uh, the problem. So that's a bit of a dilemma, why these people are going into this situation. They are, they are, they are, they are even the patients who didn't get uh, acute uh, symptoms, they, they were uh, the, the asymptomatic right from the beginning, but later on, they emerge as uh, long COVID. It's a, it's a dilemma situation. No one knows exactly how to solve this issue. So with that note, uh, I must thank again uh, for the audience and uh, the panelists and uh, for giving me this opportunity and the patients listening. Thank you.